Mr. Benjamin, where'd you go there? Thank you very much. We appreciate your time. Uh, the next speaker is Wendell Cox. Uh, Wendell actually has the distinction of traveling, having traveled here tonight from uh, all the way from St. Louis. So thank you very much for making the time and effort to come to Orange County and be with us tonight. Uh, Wendell is the principal of Demographia, a St. Louis-based international public policy consulting firm. He specializes in urban policy and demographics and was appointed to three terms on the Los Angeles County Transportation Commission. He's the co-author of a book called Demographia International Housing Affordability Survey, as well as the Demographia World Urban Areas, a regularly published resource for the population studies all over the world. He's been published in newspapers throughout the world, including the Apple Daily, which is Hong Kong, the, uh, the Daily Telegraph in London, La Stampa, which is uh, in Italy, I hadn't heard of that one, and he's also the author of Evolving Urban Form Series in NewGeography.com. This is a series of analyses focusing on the spatial expansion of world metropolitan areas, including 25 of the world's 29 megacities. He has a BA in government from California State University, Los Angeles, and an MBA from Pepperdine University. He doesn't say it here, but I know that he also has been hired by state and local governments across the country to generate reports on government efficiencies, including he was hired by the state of New York to write a very big report, and none of us know where that one went, right? That one, uh, <laughs> we're still wondering where that is. And he also manages a really excellent website, if you, you should uh, go to this if you can, The Public Purpose. This is a, uh, a website that's chock full of all kinds of different articles and studies on, uh, on good government. The Public Purpose is a great website. We're especially pleased that Mr. Cox has made the trip to visit us from St. Louis. Please welcome Mr. Wendell Cox. Actually, we do know what happened with the Association of Towns report. Uh, the consolidations never happened. The report occurred because of the Spitzer administration's commitment to trying to wipe out uh, the villages. So anyway, let me uh, give a start here. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some research that I've been involved in. I was going to talk, I'm also going to talk a little bit about uh, smart growth just because it's so important with respect to housing affordability and the economic future of uh, virtually every community in this country, including Orange County. Now, academics, my, my take on all this comes simply down to costs. And the reason costs are so important is I hope you know, and the governor knows, and state government knows, you have a real problem in New York with respect to taxation. I mean, yes, there's some years that it, Alaska is worse than you, but you've been reigning champions for decades. And it's something, if you want to be competitive in the long run, you're going to have to change. Now, academic studies routinely basically suggest that government consolidations save money. Yet, I can tell you that of all of the major consolidations that have occurred in the United States, not one single academic report has shown that any significant cost savings occur. So, right from the start, be aware of that. I've done reports in five, in five states at this point, Indiana, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Illinois, and I'll tell you about New York. And to just give you some highlights from the last report, which is an Ohio, uh, uh, the, the, the Ohio report. This report, and I, I, it was a report for the, for the Association of Townships in Ohio. Uh, this report uh, basically looked at all of the governments in Ohio, every single one of the local, not county, governments. And uh, what we found, I'm showing you the metropolitan area uh, chart because everybody thinks, well, when you talk about towns and townships, you're talking about rural, so you can't compare them to metropolitan areas. So this is just the metropolitan areas. Look at where, what we've got here. Under 1,000 population, $319 per capita spent on the basic things like fire, uh, police, libraries, community, health, etc. cetera. Uh, the, the largest cities, $1,250. And mind you, remember that Cleveland went bankrupt, the largest city it was at least at that point. Debt, same thing. And I can tell you in Illinois and, uh, and in Pennsylvania, the other two big states where we did the, the same job, we found exactly the same thing. Debt goes this way based upon population. And two states, Ohio and Pennsylvania, have what we call distressed municipality <laughs> programs. This is the data from Pennsylvania. Uh, look at, I'm sorry, no, this is the data from Ohio. 
Look at how many more of the people in Ohio live in communities that have been forced into distressed municipality programs. These are programs where the state comes in and basically uh, takes over or is giving strong advice because bankruptcy is looming. The smallest did the best. We go to uh, Pennsylvania, a little bit different way of looking at it. The blue line tells you the average local taxation because everybody assumes that these little places, the, they, they get into trouble because of their revenue. No, they get into trouble because of their spending. And look at the one that's number one there, a place called Pittsburgh, not very, not very rural. So the basic point is distressed municipality programs where they exist, and you can go to Michigan and say this, see the same thing, Essentially, the small places do better because with all due respect, public officials in smaller towns uh, basically have to because, as, as Jerry indicated, uh, they're liable to be challenged in the local uh, store uh, by their own constituents. Not something that a city councilor in New York City needs to worry about. Let's talk about government official efficiency in New York. This is our Association of Towns report. You notice here the curve doesn't look quite the same. The big cities and towns and villages, these are all municipalities in the state, tend to spend more on those kinds of services per capita than the smaller ones. The one exception is in the smallest municipalities. Those numbers are skewed by resort areas where essentially policing uh, uh, expenses are exceedingly high. Fire expenditures per capita. I like fire expendi expenditures because during the uh, battle we had with the state in 2008, there was a lot of concern about fire districts. Yet look at the, the, the cost per capita with respect to fire districts. Look at total debt per capita. Again, the same story we see in three other states. Uh, look at, and, and then you think about what is the ultimate consolidated government in the Western world? The ultimate consulted, consolidated government in the Western world isn't more than 60 miles from here. It's called New York City by virtue of the 1898 merger, which Brooklyn still hasn't gotten over, I suspect. <laughs> and the basic point is what we did here, because you see, one, one thing about New York that's difficult, and, and believe me, New York is difficult not because New York is bad, but New York is an old state. You've got traditions and laws that go back much further than most of the states out west or in the Midwest. So when you, you never really, you can't go and say, well, you know, uh, New York City spends X times as much money as Albany County or the city of Albany or anything like that because New York is a combined city-county government. You run into the same situation with San Francisco and Philadelphia and a few other places in the country. So what we did is we took those same services that I mentioned before in the Ohio report, the police, the, the basic community, library, etc., and we said, we will take the money from those services at every level of government in the county. That way we will get New York as well. And then we took the counties and divided them based upon their average jurisdiction size. That is, if there are 50 governments and there are 100,000 people, we divide the two and that's the average jurisdiction size. When you do that, look what happens. Now mind you, the average jurisdiction size in New York counties is really not that large. It's not, uh, the only one uh, over 25,000 are essentially the five counties of New York City, which we combine as one. Notice again, when you do that kind of an analysis, you get up to a point where New York City is certainly higher than the counties with smaller jurisdictions, but again, the under a thousand sort of mess up the theory a little bit. But still, uh, this is a kind of comparison one needs to have in this state uh, where spending is, is such a problem and where you have had uh, such difficulty from a competitiveness uh, standpoint uh, through the years. Now let's talk about some of the things that have happened with respect to government consolidations. But my basic point here is, you know, it is, you, you know, in a state like New York or anywhere else, you need to deliver services for the lowest possible cost. Now, I'm not talking about lousy services. I'm talking about high quality services, but not spending too much on them. And, and, and my basic point is, there's a whole lot better chance, a whole lot better uh, potential for reducing costs by reducing costs within municipalities than believe between them. Let's go through just a few examples here. And how am I doing on time, sir? I'm, uh, uh, how much time do I have? 
oh my goodness, I've gone far too fast. Come on, I might have to walk away early here. I hope that. A anyway, okay, let's let's talk about uh, Indianapolis now. People who believe in consolidative government love Indianapolis. Indianapolis is the model. Uh, they call it Unicit. Unicit. Let me tell you about Indianapolis. First of all, why did Indianapolis consolidate? Oh, was it because the local officials got together and decided, oh, wouldn't it be great if we saved some money? No. What was going on was you had a Republican establishment who had controlled the central city of, of, of Indianapolis for decades. Except, unfortunately for them, the demographics of the city were changing in the 1960s. And it became very clear to them that unless they effected a merger with Marion County, they would lose power. And it's all documented in, in research. And so what you do is you combine Marion County and Indianapolis. We're going to save money. Do you think there's ever been a report that suggests that they actually saved money? Well, yeah, I, I've seen one that suggests they may have saved a little insurance. I mean, going through all that trouble uh, to, to, uh, to, to save just a little money there. Or you can look at Jacksonville, Florida, or Nashville, Tennessee, and you will find the same thing. All sorts of research that says how wonderful it is. And all these more powerful elected officials than they used to be when they were in the city of, of, of Nashville or some other city uh, like it because they're more powerful. But did they save the voters and the, and the taxpayers any money? Not a chance. And, and, and that's the basic problem. Now, I worked in Indiana for a couple of years with the townships and on, 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 a, um, on, on a project to try to save them when Governor Mitch Daniels was committed to wiping them out, to abolishing them. And by the way, you, you, you probably can tell that my political inclination is a little bit to the right. And so far, I've told you about what the Republicans did in Marion County and what Mitch Daniels tried to do to kill the townships uh, in his last couple of years in office. We made the arguments there, we were successful, did a bunch of, uh, a test, a bunch of testimony be before the legislature, but here's one of the things that really helped us. It so happens that about the time that Mitch is attempting to wipe out the townships because they're so inefficient, and the money that you would have saved by wiping them out was inconsequential, with all due respect, by wiping them out and killing their function, quite frankly. Okay, what ended up happening is, hat in hand, the city of Indianapolis came to the state and needed a billion dollar bailout of its police and fire pension funds. Now, when is the last time that a town in this state, or any tw 10 towns, or any 100 towns with, or 500 villages ever needed a billion dollar uh, bailout of its pension funds? You see, what happens is pension funds don't go bad in smaller jurisdictions because they can't go bad because the voters are going to stop it from happening before uh, it happens for the most part. And when Mayor Ballard, the current mayor who's about to leave office, I think after two years terms, uh, took office, we had not only uh, the billion dollar pension rescue, the un uh, unfunded pension liability, and he talked of an unsustainable fiscal path. So here's our great example of a consolidation. Um, and again, you go to anybody in Indianapolis, especially the business community, they love it. Oh, you know, we're this big city, we're so much, we're world class, all this kind of thing. But the story fiscally has not been good at, at all. In 1996, the socialist government of the former city of Toronto hired me. Now, I was brought north to Canada. I was advertised as a Reagan uh, type uh, consultant. And that's not, with all due respect, I hope you don't run me out of town, but I mean, it wasn't a bad description of me. Uh, but, but what had happened is the conservative, mind you, government of Ontario, first one elected in 10 years, they'd all been liberal or socialist in the years before, uh, had proposed merging six cities to create a much bigger city of Toronto. The city of Toronto had, um, had about 700,000 people. The new city would have two and a half million. How am I doing, sir, uh, in terms of time? Okay, good. Okay, so uh, yeah, thing, things work different in a parliamentary system, you know, and beyond that, the Canadians and the Australians, to, uh, another place I've worked on this, tend to have a lot lower regard for local government in terms of how strong it is. I mean, they can come in tomorrow and change everything, which no state in this country would ever try to do. Uh, it has to do with just how much different the situation is. So anyway, um, Mayor Barbara Hall, the Socialist Mayor of Toronto, uh, made the mistake of, of, of uh, 
of, of leading a demonstration against the conservative uh, provincial government's policies uh, in front of the provincial, they call it Queen's Park, uh, the capital. Uh, and at that point, uh, Premier Mike Harris tables a bill to consolidate all these cities. So they bring me up to do a study on what are going to be the savings. And I come to the conclusion there's not a chance. And I'll give you a little preview on it. It's very simple. The Harris people said, well, you know, we got six fire departments. Now, if we, get, if we get down to one fire department, we won't have six fire chiefs. You'll have one. I said, no, they won't. They'll have six fire chiefs and one super chief. And, of course, that's what happened. They claimed with a KPMG report that was done for the provincial government that they would reduce taxes by $300 million by combining these, uh, these six cities. We ran referendums in every one of the six cities, non-binding referendums, and got 69% or more against the merger in every one of them. Now, since that time, taxes have gone up far more than, have, uh, than was, was expected. The third, nobody ever saw the $300 million. And, uh, and I can tell you up to this point, uh, the National Post, which is the second largest national newspaper in Canada, invited me to do an op-ed piece on the 10th anniversary of the merger, and I basically danced on the grave in terms, it wasn't a grave, unfortunately, because they went forward, but in terms of how bad a deal it had been, so bad that when I was involved in a, um, a debate in Toronto recently uh, with a guy, uh, with, with a socialist, and I'm not using the term uh, pejoratively, in Canada, socialist NDP party is a respected party, and they don't have the same problem with the use of that word that we do, and when I, in the debate, mentioned that the megacity, the com combination of, of Toronto into a single city was a mistake, um, he, was ready, he basically uh, uh, agreed with me. And you continually hear things about efforts to, shall we say, uh, de-amalgamate uh, Toronto. I don't think it'll ever happen, but it could. Then we move to Australia, where the Labour government of Queensland, Queensland is the northern state, it's sort of like their Florida, very fast-growing, uh, they decided that, you know, 100 governments or whatever it was was too many, maybe it was 150, they needed to cut down to 75. So they come in and they do a royal commission and they redraw boundaries and everything, a lot of unhappy people. So much so that eventually when the new election came along, the, the new party that came to power uh, basically decided that it would table legislation to, amalgam to, to de amalgamate the city <laughs> that had been created. Unfortunately, as I will tell you in a moment about Quebec, they didn't really keep the promise. What they did is they came in with impossible electoral uh, requirements in terms of petitions. There was no such thing as a 10% petition drive to dissolve a community. You were just looking at situations with having to get more than 50% of the vote and having to get a lot of petition signatures. Only uh, they, they, 19 of the cities sought de-amalgamation uh, the province, I should say the state, uh, disqualified 15 of them because they were financially not sustainable in the province's view. The four cities that remained, including one, which is a large city as a part of the Sunshine Coast, which is the third largest, uh, used to be anyway, the third largest city in Queensland until it was de-amalgamated. Um, every one of the four cities approved uh, the de-amalgamation, and in Noosa, in Sunshine Coast, uh, it was an 80% margin. Then we go to Montreal. In about 2002, the, Liber the, uh, the, the uh, Quebecois government uh, decided that it needed to combine all of the cities on Montreal Island into one. And so you see on this map what Montreal Island looked like before the amalgamation, what it looked like after. See, all the cities are gone, and now we have just the city of Montreal. This was so unpopular that when the next election came along, the Liberals won, and they promised de-amalgamation. But they made the same kind of mistake that was laid, made or laid, made, made by the uh, Queensland people, and they made it a very tough process. Not only did you have to get a majority vote, which is quite reasonable, but the number of people voting for the de-amalgamation had to equal at least 35% of, um, of the registered voters. So on that basis, they probably could never get, could, could get anything to pass. In any event, 19 cities voted to de-amalgamate, and now you see the new Montreal. Uh, I was also pleased to be, uh, you know, I didn't make any money on the deal, but after some of the work I had done, I was contacted by a place that was forced, 
was faced with, the amal with amalgamation in New South Wales, the largest state where Sydney is located. And I basically just shared information with them and talked with them. And we were able to basically block uh, this amalgamation at the state commission level the first time an amalgamation had been blocked. Here's one of the big problems that a lot of people don't realize, though, with respect to amalgamation. Um, it is not, you know, you think about, you, you, people love to go out to fire departments. Oh, you know, those fire trucks are so expensive. If we could only merge these two towns or the village and the town, we can have fewer fire trucks. Well, you know what? That's not the problem. The problem isn't capital spending. You see the sort of strange, bad choice dollars. This sort of greedy, that's capital costs in the five states that I dealt with. Things like fire trucks, buildings, etc., on an annual basis. The yellow is other expenses and the green is labor. And this is why consolidations tend to be more costly in the long run. It is because labor costs get leveled up. Let's say that village A and town B decide they're going to merge. And let's say we have uh, different labor contracts that we're most certainly going to have. Which labor contract do you think will be controlling in the final analysis? Do you think that the labor leader, even if it's the same guy in the less expensive labor contract area, is going to go to the members and say, you know, for the public good, we've got to take less money. Or, you know, we, we got to it's not going to happen. It never has happened. In fact, the Toronto slide before I showed you was a picture of something having to do with the Toronto Central City Association that supported the amalgamation of Toronto and later said it was a mistake because the costs were all leveled up. In other words, they go to the highest level, and that, by the way, is an argument we made in that discussion. Uh, so the leveling up of service costs, uh, of, of labor contracts and so on, in addition to that, there is the potential uh, for service levels to be leveled up, to give areas that don't want as much service more service, that costs money. There's less access for voters. You're not going to run into Jerry in the grocery store anymore, maybe. And here's my basic point. A lot of people think that larger jurisdictions have economies of scale. None of the data shows that if you look at expenditures per capita at local government level. The only economies of scale that exist in consolidations are economies of scale for special interests. You open access to special interests and you reduce the role of people. Citizens lose control. Uh, Eleanor Ostrom, um, Nobel Prize winner in 2009, uh, made points along these lines as well. I won't go into that because I think I'm getting uh, very close. Uh, but I agree with a lot of what Jerry said. The, the concept, of course, of fiscal, of fiscal federalism, where you find the right level, there is no perfect level. Uh, and I, by the, by the way, of course, believe in shared services. I think you need to make sure that anything that happens in terms of consolidation happens with the, with the, with the support of the people. I would argue along the lines of Lincoln, government of the people, by the people, for the people, is government that is closer to the people. Now just one last point on smart growth and urban containment policy, and that's going on around here. I just want you to be aware how these policies to restrict land seriously in terms of urban development and residential development are destroying housing affordability. If you look at this, this is out of yesterday's Wall Street Journal, Mind you, out of our democratic demographic housing affordability survey, they're making the point that housing costs are eight and nine times, ten times incomes in places like Sydney and Melbourne. In San Francisco, they're the same. In Portland, they're five. And before 1970, in 1970, before all these new wonderful land use regulations, the, the ratio between housing costs and, um, and, and incomes was three, and it still is in Texas and in most of the country. So that's a real problem, especially if you're interested in keeping young people, because all of the data shows that uh, people tend to follow housing affordability. How's this? California's housing affordability is so bad that its housing cost adjusted poverty rate is one and a half times that of Mississippi and double that of West Virginia. What a wonderful arrangement that is. And this sort of indicates the problem New York has in terms of attracting people. This is over the last 15 years, essentially. Domestic migration, movement between the states. You see on a percentage basis, New York is the worst, even worse than Katrina. I, excuse me, the, the New Orleans, or Louisiana after Katrina. So all I'm saying is be very careful about land use regulation. 
land use regulation needs to be limited by its impact on housing affordability. But anyway, thank you. I apologize for perhaps going a little bit over.